Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sorting Hat Podcast, the show where everything and anything can and will be sorted. I, as always, am your host, Michael Verity, joined by my co-host, Reed Bryce. Michael had followed the opening over to Reed, expecting something good, mm. but was bound to be disappointed. Okay, now which author are you? <laughs> I don't know. That sounds kind of like Nicholas Sparks, but y'all know I don't read. <laughs> sure. Uh, the, the basic conceit of the show is that we have a friend who is knowledgeable or has things to say on a various topic, and then we sort those things into the various houses of Hogwarts. Today, we are joined by uh, an actor, singer, and my cousin. What? Uh, all the way uh, from a basement in Tennessee. <laughs> uh, the ultimate opening. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is Galen Crawley York. Welcome, Galen. Hello, I'm so excited to virtually be here. I know you're our first remote guest as far as I know. Yes. This is very yeah. exciting. Oh my goodness. And then what are we starting today with, with, with Galen here? Uh, we're sorting sort of a... Uh, a potpourri of high school literature. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Because uh, so Galen is reading always been like a very important like uh, touchstone in your life. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I um, when I was in elementary school and was reading the Chronicles of Narnia for the first time, I was like, mm-hmm. this bedroom is not cozy enough for reading. I need a nook. So I like rearranged my whole closet and put blankets and pillows down in the back of my walk in closet because I was like, I need a proper reading nook. That is so cute. At my age, I was probably covered head to toe in mud more often than I was. Yeah. <laughs> so I that's was, a very different vibe that you have going on. You're I, like, I am the, I am an indoor girl. I love to read, <laughs> and uh, all throughout high school, I found that I generally really liked all of our required reading. There were some. <laughs> Uh, exceptions, of course, but like I was the person that everybody else would be like, oh my God, this book is so boring. And I was like, "Uh oh, I really like this book. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to be a very interesting spread just across uh, myself and Reed because we like obviously the American lit like core is, you know, somewhat uh national in scope of- yeah like you, you know every, everybody will be like oh yeah i read that book around this time but right. there, there will be a few like flavorful little like yeah. local things because because sure. galen grew up in uh in georgia yes so, okay uh so and and you also said that your reading list you presume is a little more oddball than yeah most. i was in like gifted and ap courses throughout mm-hmm. all of high school so um in prepping for this i was talking to my husband and trying to be like okay so what what did i read sophomore year what did i read freshman year and there were a number of titles that i mentioned that he was like what that he <laughs> and, and he was like i think your required reading was really weird. So oh, I'm so excited then. Have, I don't know. Some of these may be a little off the wall. I'm. I. I also had. I. I. I'm sure I don't have your exact situation, but I did my sophomore year have a teacher who made us do some like. Oh, these are like what is re- required by the state books, and then like here are some other books that you should like be familiar with. Like we read all the pretty horses and like waiting, which are like not necessarily in the like pantheon of like brave new world in 1984. Yeah. Yeah. Where I was like, I also came from a, from a a district where maybe the expectations weren't as high. So like in 12th grade, we're still trying to get through Beowulf. And then my partner will turn to me and say, what does metaphor mean? That's (laughs) really what happened to me in my senior year of high school. (laughs) Uh, So in case it was unclear to the listener, uh, Galen is a bit of a Ravenclaw. Just Mm. a touch, just a tad. Uh, I am also a Ravenclaw and Reed is a Hufflepuff as like far I as said, in a class where they would not necessarily know what a metaphor means. Uh, so uh, take those uh, sorting bias, you know, in, in mind as we dive into it. But uh, let's get sorted. OK, Woo. so yeah, we're going to start with your freshman year, right? Freshman year. And uh, OK, so I figure we should start with the Odyssey. Perfect. Because okay, that Three seems days, to be like a written language, or like when they were writing stuff down, right? I mean, um, it's it's a written story, but 
I thought it was one of those ones that was like they talked about it. <laughs> How do you think call that? So. I'm pretty sure Homer just like sat down and wrote it all out. I think he was like, I got this pen. I got these ideas. Let's do it. Okay. And then if somebody hasn't uh, read the Odyssey, can you give us like a, a brief synopsis of it? So the our hero Odysseus has been at war and the war was real the war was real long and now he's like woo won this war but now I got to go home and so he's trying to go home okay very standard war's sort over. of narrative war's done <laughs> but he's got to go home and uh and uh what what about it did you did you connect to in this story that like you're like oh this is still significant to me you know, honestly, this was probably one of the ones that I I really don't remember too much about this mm-hmm. one because for me at like this point in my life, I we had I think we did Beowulf right before this one. I think Beowulf was maybe also a freshman year. Mm-hmm. Um and I was like the epic poetry really kind of wasn't doing it for me. Um so I really don't remember a ton about this one and I remember specifically at the time being like, well, wait, but the war is over. We're just doing, he's going and meeting, you know, Medusa and the sirens and all this, but like, man, if only this guy could take a plane. Yeah. It did. It didn't necessarily resonate with you as, as much as one would hope. No, this was one of the, this was one of the ones really that I did not personally like super connect with. Mm-hmm. Um, this was definitely the required and required reading. Oh, sure. I don't think there's any like contemporary kid, except for maybe those with reading nooks, who take one look at the Odyssey and go, this is my shit. <laughs> yeah, this one, this one to me is like, um, uh, this, this was not greatly personally relevant to me, but I read it. <laughs> I had to and I did. <laughs> I mean and there's some interesting things like even if as I take a glance uh at the Odyssey some you know important things uh, about this one apparently is like it didn't necessarily follow a linear plot and I do know about the mm. around this time uh what were they called the the unities of narrative structure especially in uh dramatic literature more were more important uh the unities of like time space and stuff like that like uh so the fact that like this was a story that could jump around and the readers would still be able to keep like know exactly what was going on is pretty significant for for the time period and then also uh it's it's also also a poet it's it's presented poetically instead of prose right yeah and it yes exactly so it's it is an epic poem um So, yeah, it is like I think very much was meant to be like not sung literally, but like I do think there's an element to that. It's like a look what you were saying about the oral tradition. This one is it draws, of course, on all of these myths Mm -hmm. that were that were told um, orally for I don't know, hundreds of years, thousands it's of years. It's got a performative quality in the way that it's been presented or even yeah, adapted, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, sure. Um, and so it, while it was written by an author, it draws so much on that oral tradition and on the like myths of the gods in Greece that it feels like a bridge between literature and like the oral tradition and drama. Oh, perfect. Do you have a sense of how it's sorted? I mean, I feel like it's a Gryffindor. I could probably agree with that because the story itself also, if I'm remembering correctly, it, it, it like, especially compared to other works of the time, it was more about uh, exploring the complexity of humans. Like I remember like slave characters and women weren't necessarily treated as p- complete props <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and just catalysts for the men to like have things happening in their life. And obviously it's still going to be that way because it's Odysseus. And I also remember, yeah, and- like, wasn't he also, like, his thing was, like, he was also, like, a smart dude. So, like, he was a hero, not just in the fact that he could fight everybody, but also, like, he could outsmart people to get what he well, needed. yeah. And and especially I remember, I remember the section about the sirens mm-hmm. where, you know, he wanted to experience the sound, the song of the sirens. So he's like, okay, well, tie me to the mast and I won't, 
plug my ears up, but you guys all stuff. What was it? Was it like wool? He I, has wool all or of cotton, his crew. Something yeah. yeah, he has like all his stru- crew stuff. I wool love in their ears. the sirens, by the way. I think they're so cool. <laughs> that was definitely my favorite part. Like a bunch but, of yeah, queer women it, who like take what they need from men. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. The call in all the call in all the heroic boys to come crash their ships. Yeah, they're like, hey, fuck boys, some come destroy your ships. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh at Queens. You. <laughs> Queens. But yeah, Icons. so Homer is intelli- or not Homer. Odysseus is intelligent because he has this plan, but also is so moved by his emotions mm-hmm. because he wants to experience I mean, like in that sense, he he wants to experience the whole the whole thing is just like this all. sweeping uh need to get home as well like it, yes. it's, it's it's entirely impassioned in its yes in its quest i feel confident in it as a gryffindor absolutely his name literally means trouble or something like that let's <laughs> move on what's next next i have i think probably this is the seminal required reading book mm-hmm. uh and also the seminal great american novel any guesses Oh, uh, the great American novel. Oh, is the it a, uh, um, To Kill a Mockingbird? Or Indeed it is. Oh, yeah. you got it. I was going to say The Scarlet Letter, and then I was like, wait, is that American? Yes, it is, because it takes it place. Is. <laughs> yeah, Tester Prynne and Roger Chillingworth. And, or, you know, it could or, be European pilgrims. <laughs> We're bridging the continents with that. Oh, Scarlet goodness. Letter will, spoiler alert, Scarlet Letter's coming down the pipe. Gotcha. <laughs> to Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, to okay. Kill a Mockingbird. We did that my freshman year. Mm-hmm. Um, and where, uh, around when was this one written again? Was it the 20s, 30s? Oh, gosh. Oh, no, now, it was the 60s. Um, it was later, I'm right? feel silly. I think it was the 60s. Mm-hmm. Right. Harper Lee, Harper Lee's one of those authors that I always think that she lived earlier than she did, and I don't know why. That's me and Tolkien. Ah. Oh, yeah. You're like, wait, that dude was alive when? Uh, But yeah, uh, Harper Lee's tale of uh, injustice and uh, good old Gregory Peck Mm -hmm. later portrayed. uh, uh, Oh, my goodness. Why am I blanking on his name? Atticus Finch. There we go. Atticus Finch and Scout and Boo Radley. Well, uh, can you Mm -hmm. give us a brief rundown if we don't know who any of those characters are? Yes. So. Atticus Finch is the hero of the novel, but he is the father of the, I would say, the main protagonist and the narrator, mm-hmm. Scout. Scout's a little girl, and the book does take place in the mid-30s. I see. Um, okay, that was that was probably what I was mixing up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's, so it's, she's it's recollecting. It's set in, like, Depression-era rural Alabama, yeah. and Scout is a little girl, maybe like 8 or 10, um, but not she's got nine. an older brother. And so the story is through her eyes of being raised by a single father and she's a tomboy. And they're kind of like a weird, not like outcast family because they're very well respected, but she definitely has a unique perspective. And um, a man in her town is, <laughs> spoiler alert, wrongfully accused of... Um, rape and murder i don't think he kills the woman no no no. just just rape because uh she is present Mm -hmm. Uh, that's right she's present at the trial yes and and Um, and it's like very apparent that she's caught in a lie and that that's like one of the larger frustrations of the piece is that like clearly uh like clearly there is bias and prejudice that is just in 1930s Alabama? <laughs> I Yeah, I know it's a shocker. Um, <laughs> nah. uh, and I, I do know, obviously, like the major the major uh, motifs that they're dealing with are other uh, ones of, of, of race and especially like uh, the, the violent disenfranch- uh, and, uh, disenfranchisement and like, you know, uh, uh, the way that. You know, black men were just easily slandered. <laughs> yeah, uh, all this all this woman had to do essentially was be like, no, it was this black man, which is something and that was like historic, like has a lot her. of historical uh, precedent. <laughs> yes, it does. Indeed, it does. Uh, yeah, obviously, very obviously, this kind of thing actually happened. Uh, Emmett Till. Yeah, yeah, I think Emmett Till is like if you don't 
under don't know that story and can understand it. I don't I think you don't necessarily have a place to be talking about race politics in America whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this this book was like uh, obvious, you know, came out in 1960 um, and is still so relevant. Um, And. Yeah, and Atticus Finch is, of course, one of the like great American like uh, characters, I think. I th- and certainly, I think, one of the most recognizable characters because he, when faced with uh, an unfair situation, is willing to stand up and defend right. somebody. And I mean, granted, he's defending his client. <laughs> <You know. laughs> yeah, it's, it's already built in that he has uh, a reason to want to defend this person. But, you know, yes. it was... It was noteworthy, especially for the time that even that it was written, the idea of a white person not only necessarily being open to the idea of other races being equal, but being willing to put some of their own personal safety on the line to protect. Yes. That way, that's what allyship ultimately comes down to. It's not ideology or best intentions. It's, it's action and what you're willing to actually do and actually sacrifice in order to keep other people safe. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, the, it is interesting now. Um, the PBS just did that special, The Great American Read, mm-hmm. where they um, they went through and I think did a list of maybe the hundred greatest American novels. Um, and To Kill a Mockingbird was at the top of the list. And it started a big conversation on Twitter about uh, I thought it was really fascinating were people examining Atticus and his motivations and people being like, because it is a story written by a white woman that centers around the perspective of a white child Mm -hmm. who is looking at the lens of this world. And her main focal point is on her father, Atticus, because that's what she sees. And so it was it led to this really interesting, the sprawling conversation on Twitter of people like reexamining Atticus and especially with the publication of Ghosts at a Watchman a few years ago, Mm -hmm. which... I, I don't know. That's an entire can of worms. Um, <laughs> and I, I think it's a fair criticism, though. Atticus well, and his, like, legacy and, like, well, hang on. You know, this is a story about race with the perspective of a white person. But but Atticus does put, like what you said, he puts his family's safety on the line. He has two young children. Um, and he knows that in defending Tom mm-hmm. that it's going to – that it – can and does endanger his family. Yeah, because right. the the Yules um, are kind of drunkard assholes, like within the town, who are not aren't go like like if I recall correctly, when the father is brought on the stand or the daughter is brought on the stand, like at, at some point, basically, like uh, Atticus, like kind of runs circles around them logically, uh-huh. and that just gets them like frustrated and angry because they're not willing to admit to those things. And then they're just like outwardly like threatening him. Like it's, it's, but uh, uh, just to, just to jump back, I think there's an, um, to the Twitter conversation. I think Mm -hmm. that whether intentional or not, Harper Lee writing from the perspective of a child actually is a like, is narratively couching some of like your obvious I cannot speak to like the like the the actual plight of Tom Robinson because I am not a like so it's it's almost allowing to uh couch your naivete in a character it's that such a inha- it's such a yeah. clever framing device that ultimately is like is it pushing the cause as far as it could no is it ho- hope is it holding the hand of people who maybe need their hand held in terms mm-hmm. of like understanding racial politics to begin with maybe but also like <laughs> yeah. it it grants you a lot more uh wiggle room or flexibility however you want to view it um, because if you were to set it as sort of like a, an objective narrative of the way things went forward, I think there would be more direct criticism of yeah, and a lot of things that transpired if it were presented as it kind of is. Yeah, it's genius. It, yeah. it says like you are going to read this book knowing this child will have blind spots 
And then mm-hmm. in the purpose of doing so, Lee is also being like, we're going to also be examining your blind spots reader, but you're not going to know yeah, it because exactly. you're going to be just uh, experiencing it all through a child. <laughs> uh, so how do yeah. we feel about uh, sorting? I personally would put this book as a Hufflepuff. Oh, interesting. I was kind of thinking it a Ravenclaw. Oh, OK. Ooh, okay. Well, well, why, why do you uh, two feel uh, the way that you do? I think I think uh, Ravenclaw just on the um, basis one in in its narrative framing is like a clever way of sort of working around some obvious like these are areas where I cannot fully speak on these topics. So I am I am slanting things in a in a rather uh, unique and clever way. Uh, But like a doctor who has such good bedside manner, you don't even realize you've gotten the shot. Yeah, Yeah. Mm. sort of like it's it's not. And also, in some ways, I mean, a lot of the lessons that Scout learns are like directly professorially presented to her by the, yeah. uh, Atticus. Like, and because a it lot is, of it is in trial procedural. Sort exa- of. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It, it's presented as like, these are the lessons. Like when you're presented this thing, you do this thing because and like we have an ethical discussion. Okay. So it feels like the the whole thing is like a you know it's really dr- like unlike some books where the themes and motifs are a little more buried these are much more like no 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 we want to address this directly we're not trying to be like overly clever about it okay and then yeah, what, what do you think is, for hufflepuff there is totally an element to the book i completely agree with you of like literally atticus saying this is why i think this mm-hmm. um and really just laying things out very plainly My argument for why it's a Hufflepuff is I think that so much of this book is about justice Mm -hmm. and fairness. And that is a very Hufflepuff quality. But also, too, something that we didn't even talk about in all of the in the our synopses and discussions of it is the character of Boo Radley, who is... I think a lot of times if people haven't revisited the novel in a long time, it can be easy to conflate the characters of Boo and Tom because Boo Radley is very misunderstood. He's the neighbor. He was a recluse. Um, he's very misunderstood. The kids are like kind of obsessed with him yeah. because he is unseen. And then at the end of the novel, he is the one that rescues the kids, he rescues Jem and Scout and Dill when they're attacked by the Yules mm-hmm. in the woods. And Boo, like, comes out and saves them. Um, and I think while Atticus lays out his arguments and stuff very logically in a very Ravenclaw-ish manner, I feel like overall the... When I think of this book, I think of it as, like, an embrace and... Um, that it is a very, I think it's like a, Harper Lee found this way to tell this very complicated story in a warm way that feels very soothing and gives you these lessons without really beating you over the head. Mm. Even while Atticus is like very plainly stating his, right. his opinions. Uh, and, and, I, and, and I think it is so much, I think this book is so much about learning to re-examine your own prejudices and learning to re-examine what other people project onto what society projects onto individuals and that to me feels like a very hufflepuff quality i can totally see that because yeah like ultimately i feel like if you don't have necessarily uh the critical thinking skills yet for like why would this boo rally person be important to the, the the main story of racial injustice, uh, you can eventually get just around to the idea of like, oh, he's being presented as a device uh, to help you understand othering in a very simplified way, whereas racial othering is so much more complex and right. systematic. Uh, because with uh, this book, as far as I remember, also deals with other things that are more nuanced uh within the culture of uh, of american culture where we very much pride ourselves and celebrate the idea of multiculturalism and embracing everybody in a melting pot but in practice we almost always lead our lives with like how are people the same as me and those are my people Mm -hmm. and then who's different because i remember also 
uh, them dealing with like class issues in the South. And then Scout herself yes. is a very progressive character, even though she's not necessarily like second wave feminist uh, sort of gal. She is, like you said, a tomboy. And even that we have to like, see like how does the world perceive her and treat her because of this mm-hmm. and so i think it's mm-hmm. all about that and so i would agree maybe with the hufflepuff angle that's fair <laughs> i'm all good right. with that let's shift on to well now i figure we can do a just a little like lightning round flash sort for two other freshman year oh, reads okay and Hit just us. off the off the hip off the hip okay. let's just do it uh great expectations Okay, what, what's that one about? Great Expectations is Dickens. We've got Pip, who is an orphan, mm-hmm. and Pip is uh, taken under the wing of a wealthy benefactress. Uh, he's in love with, what's her name? What's the name of the chick he's in love with? I don't even remember. I can't tell you because I didn't have to read it. <laughs> oh, Reed, did you have to do Great Expectations? No, I. that's why oh, uh, I especially man. asked on this one because I was like, I have not read this one. Okay, I then my just flash sort, uh, I put this one in a Ravenclaw. I'm going to put it in Ravenclaw because Dickens was paid by the frickin' word, and you can tell. Ah, oh, um, okay. Great Expectations is also very... F- I found Great Expectations to be really funny, and everybody else in my class hated it and couldn't wait to finish it. So you um, think as a Ravenclaw, like, there was an odd degree of Dickens' Ravenclaw humor that appeals to you? I think so. Dickens' Dickens's humor is... I mean, because truly, literally, the man was paid by the word. Mm-hmm. So it, the the stories are verbose. Um, and his humor is, I remember specifically, there's one scene at the end where uh, Pip is helping, like a, helping somebody put on a glove. And literally the description of it is, is that he ends up standing behind the old man, like behind a column and is like trying to yank his gloves on with using like the co- the column as a support as a brace i i and, love and you're just dickens he his just, his sense of humor was so weird <laughs> it's so weird and but is so wordy that it just gets lost so much of the time i have so, to imagine dickens, if it's dickens we're Ravenclaw. probably dealing with themes of class and poverty oh, it's probably yeah. more on oh, the melodramatic yeah. side because he was like you said verbose <laughs> is it mm-hmm. is it possible then actually that this might be a slytherin it may be based but, based on the like clever clever twisting mm-hmm. of like we're doing this like per word and also in dealing with class that is sort of like a trope that crops up among Slytherins periodically. I mean that is very true. If you're going to talk about class, it'll come up the most because they they tend to be elitist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I do think. Uh, the character of Mrs. Havisham sort of, or Miss Havisham, excuse me, she is unmarried. She is not a Mrs. Um, to me, the character of Miss Havisham is such a, like, she is such a gothic invention. Mm-hmm. Um, and so macabre that I can't really see a Slytherin letting themselves be that much of a, like, weirdo laughing stock. Mm. And that, to me, feels like a very Ravenclaw thing. And since um, neither Reed nor I can really contest it, having not read the man. book, we're going to go with you on that. I trust well, you. Then and then uh, what was the other? To, what's the other lightning round one? The other lightning round one, and this is, I do think, a super weirdo. It is Ayn Rand, but it's not Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged. It was Anthem. We read Anthem. You have an Ayn Rand deep cut for the pod. Oh, my goodness. Uh-huh. We're going with the novella. Now, how do you feel about Ayn Rand in in, in, uh, in general? I think this and all other Ayn Rands, we can just put firmly in the Slytherin box. <laughs> okay, a libertarian, a Slytherin. My God, my wig's flying what? off. <laughs> Wait, what? Personal responsibility? If you don't know who Ayn Rand in any of her, her, her oeuvre, uh, what, what was this book about? Honest, honestly, I don't even remember. I mean, this one, <laughs> this one was like it. It what a shock! It takes place like at like a factory. <laughs> it's it's like the anthem was like from, and I specifically didn't look this one up um, because the my only memories of this book 
art of reading it, and it, like, takes place at, like, a factory or something, like all of her books. Yes. And I remember being 14 and reading this book and being like, this is, this is a libertarian fever dream. It is... Yes. It, it, it takes place in a world where everybody acts, quote unquote, rationally all the time. Ugh, like, um, it, like the, the sort of attitude that's like sprung up like this whole culture now we have of like the uh, the jaded skeptic who thinks yes. that their cold rationality is the only way to approach empirical data, even mm-hmm. though that's not necessarily how the sciences work at all. But no. <laughs> and and the. uh Ayn Rand's insistence that, like, every single person can and should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Regardless of what who, their life situation like, is. Like, didn't she call yeah, it something exactly. really, like, ugh, like, ethical egoism or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, no. Ayn Rand, Slytherin. Great. This is some, this Shifting is some Slytherin into BS. sophomore year. All right, sophomore what's happening? Sophomore year. Uh, sophomore year had... Probably more of my favorite books than any other year that I did any other year of mine in school. Um, And to start it off, I think we'll start off with one that probably you guys didn't have to do. So this will probably be a lightning round one. Um, The Once and Future King. Did you guys read that one? I'm sorry, the what? The Once and Future King. The Once and Future King. Who's that by? This is, it's by T.H. White and it is the Arthurian legend. Mm. So The Once and Future King is actually four books. The Sword and the Stone, which, yes, that Sword and the Stone, the one that the Disney book is based on. Um, The Book of Merlin. And then I forget what the last two are called. But it is T.H. White's epic novel that begins when Arthur is a young child, Wart, who does not know he's the king. And Merlin takes him under his wing and teaches him all about being... um, teaches him magic, essentially. This is the book where you get the idea of Merlin turning, he turns Wart into a bird. And Arthur, young Arthur, known as Wart, has to live as a bird for like a week. And he learns what it's like to be a bird by being a bird. Gotcha. Um, And he pulls the sword from the stone. And then in the next book, he is the king and he meets Guinevere and Lancelot. It's the entire Arthurian legend. uh, uh, As I'm reading here, uh, apparently there wasn't as much of an emphasis on making sure that everything was like exactly historically accurate. It was like almost like intentionally uh, anachronistic. Is that how you say it? Totally. Yeah. I, I th- Wait, yeah, absolutely. You mean it wasn't historically accurate when he turned into a bird for a week? I mean, in that the in the fact that like they the would not necessarily did happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying like uh, that it could happen in real life physically. I'm saying like even the the way that they set it up was that he wasn't concerned with using the right language from oh. the time period and stuff. Oh, I yeah. see. So he was the favoriting it a little bit. Exactly. Oh, the favorite is a is Ooh. a perfect example of where uh, what's being said is more important than how it's being said. Right? Would you mm-hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, and 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 again, this is a book that is particularly in the first book, The Sword and the Stone. It is so funny. It's it's hilarious. The language is is really funny. There's a whole section with um, this beast known as the Questing Beast, which is just like the Questing Beast is off in the woods somewhere and. <laughs> One of the older knights that comes to stay with at the manor where Wart and his brother live is um, in search of the questing beast. And he's going to find the questing beast and kill it. But when he finds the questing beast, it's very sweet. And so the questing beast becomes their pet, essentially. Oh, that's so and funny. And just like, lives yeah. at the manor. That's, and that's such a funny way to do it, of infusing uh, this creature with like this expectation of what it needs to be by its very name. It's like you are... You are my sole yes. reason for being and then having that subverted when you actually get up to see this person. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and then he beautiful. finally finds the questing beast and is like, oh, this it's like it's essentially just like a giant dog. Yeah. And, but, and like, like what a silly sweet. like Monty Python sort of name to give. Like this is the questing beast. It's the yes. reason I have a quest. Yeah. <laughs> How do I quest is... without a questing beast? 
but then the, it goes on, and as it goes on, it becomes more and more serious, and you sort of lose those fantastical elements a little bit. Yeah. I mean, there's still magic throughout the story because of Merlin and um, Morgoth, who is the like the like big bad. Morgoth is Mordred's mother and blah blah blah. But anyway, I think this one is another like classic Gryffindor. It's King Arthur from a child. Oh yeah, King Arthur's the ultimate Gryffindor. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and also ultimate Gryffindor too in that like, you know, he's betrayed when his queen has mm -hmm. an affair with Lancelot and he's heartbroken about it. He he's got a telenovela also, life. Oh, for sure. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> he's he's heartbroken okay. about it but doesn't um but it doesn't like drive him mad or make him evil or anything. He he still has like an understanding about it in some way. Um, and of course it's, it's a story about like heroes and adventures and magic. So to me, that is just very Gryffindor. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, shifting on. Uh, so moving on then next is Fahrenheit 451. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I remember reading this one in school. This Can you give a us a, a recap? Year one for me. And this was one that as I was thinking about it, just like to jump straight to the sorting, I have no idea where to put this one, frankly. Well, um, I mean, it's it, it falls into that fun category of uh, dystopian futures mm -hmm. uh, where the protagonist is, you know, aligned with the bad guys uh, who at some point suddenly has like a reawakening or realization that maybe the th Maybe we're the baddies. <laughs> yeah. uh, as, as in this case, it's Winston, I believe. Uh, yes. And he is a firefighter. However, mm -hmm. in this universe. Guy it Montag is, is his name. Oh, Guy Montag. What? Whoops. Oh, no. Winston is 1984. That's right. That's right. That's right. I'm mixing Very up my dystopian themes. futures. <laughs> um, Which. Spoiler alert, I have 1984 as a senior year book. Oh, so. really? That's interesting. Thanks I read that my sophomore year. Mm. I did not actually read 1984 in high school. Oh my! Okay. Um, well, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna address that later. But uh, it's mm -hmm. back to foreign back Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit 451. Because uh, books are illegal in this universe, yes, right? Books yes. are illegal. It's the idea of like knowledge is power is bad mm -hmm. because it'll and everyone I believe like most Ray Bradbury sort of stuff. The, the world is warped and wonderful and there are lots of screens and it's very I mean, it's a black mirror, like wet dream. Yeah. And and the I remember specifically them talking about how the TV screens in the house are literally entire walls. Mm -hmm. And is that yeah. also is that what they call them? Do they call them walls? Uh, I don't remember what the name I don't is. recall, but he he's used that device um, or like, or not that device, but the, the mm -hmm. idea of like full walls being screens. Uh, yeah. there's, there's yeah. this one short that he wrote the nursery, I believe. Uh, have you read that? Uh, uh, it's, it's the idea of like, this kid is put in a nursery and all four walls, I believe are television screens and mm. it like simulates worlds for this kid and the kid never oh, eventually no. wants to leave. And then if i recall the ending is like the parents go in to get the child but the child isn't there and the room or the nursery simulates uh like the sahara desert and a tiger shows up and then like it's alluded that the tiger jumps out of the screen and kills the person oh, because gotcha. they've like created this but uh okay, in terms of like hunter prey situation it winds up with our main character our firefighter who like takes and hides a book and then reads it and is enlightened by all its knowledge is then hunted by the very organization that he was a part of. I, if mm -hmm. I recall, there are like robot dogs that are chasing after him. Oh, we got some metal head up in here. Yeah, <laughs> it, it gets it gets all wild. Oh, yeah, like because because I know uh, especially Bradbury was very critical of the media and mm -hmm. especially the way that things were presented to people and kind of like you know, and I think it's more prescient now than ever of the media telling us, you know, I, I'm going to sound like a fucking, you know, conspiracy theorist. But just like they tell us, like, mm, we know what's important for you to know mm -hmm. and we know what's, yeah. what you don't need to necessarily know. And it kind of like as a feedback loop of people like, well, 
reading is also boring and you know there's a whole lot of like unpleasant details that i have to know if i read right whereas if i if i get everything from buzzfeed gifts that's fun and i don't necessarily have to think about the bad things <laughs> maybe sure. this one maybe this one is as simple as it seems maybe this is just kind of like the ultimate raven claw that's kind like, of where i'm so leaning oh God, i mean <laughs> who's going to cry over burning books more than a raven claw <laughs> yeah yeah i uh, yeah the, as we've been talking about it i've been like this is probably actually a very easy one to sort this is hermione screaming have you guys not read hogwarts a history exactly for seven books <laughs> <laughs> what do we have next Next up is, I think, another, like, truly seminal uh, required reading, Lord of the Flies. Yes, Lord oh, of the Flies, yeah. I do remember. Yes. Terrifying. Now, my <laughs> sophomore year was broken up a little weird, where half the class read Lord of the Flies and half the class read a separate piece. Ooh. I did not read a separate piece. I read Lord of the Flies. Having and not read a separate piece, I'm at an advantage because I did read Lord of the Flies. <laughs> See, okay, great. And it's also because I did not read a separate piece. Um, it is really weird to me that those were the two choices. Honestly, I am so, like, I went to such a public school. When you said a separate piece, I thought you were saying they read something else that I don't know what it was. <laughs> and it's only when Michael being like, I have not read a separate piece that I suddenly was like, I too am not informed on this one. But mostly it's like, exactly. oh shit, that was a name. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of that book, and I don't even remember Same who wrote it. Now. I don't even remember the name. I just, re from my knowledge of a separate piece, based on hearing other people talk about a separate piece, it's about kids at boarding school and someone falls out of a tree. That's all I got. So, okay. Um, so the overlapping theme in these two stories is kids, maybe yes. like, and at least in both of them, they're moderate dicks, but in another case, they are murderous dicks. Because yeah, yes. if I'm remembering correctly, in this one, it's all about like Golding sets it up like this class of boys were on a plane it's wartime mm -hmm. they crash it's uninhabited and they don't know if or when any rescue's coming so they just are like right. okay well what what does civilization look like but we're 10 mm -hmm. year, 10 year old boys it's all boys right yeah okay. yes it's all boys and they uh the main and i don't remember the names of the kids in this book except for piggy piggy's the only name of any child yeah, that i remember i think really. everybody remembers piggy there's because... also a ralph i remember I oh okay i think ralph is the protagonist yeah I or at believe... least that yeah or like because it does wait but i do remember this story being strange and it was something as like i was not as voracious a reader every once in a while it would switch perspective uh yes of like who was because uh it was trying to give you glimpses of like all of the different sides of people's humanity and so it couldn't necessarily do that with one child yeah and it and there are also some sequences that um that are really impressionistic almost like dream sequences yeah yes. everything with everything with the beast or the pig head a lot of mm -hmm. the violence because uh, essentially a uh, spoiler alert these kids do not have a good time <laughs> No, they don't. It's Children not end up getting murdered by each other and dying yeah. in the elements because they don't know what the fuck they're doing. And there's so the there's like one group of boys that is like, OK, well, we've crashed on this island. So let's like keep ourselves alive and we will try to write things in the sand. We'll try to write SOS in the sand with logs and rocks so that if a plane passes, they'll see us. And then, yeah, and, and then, then quickly, there's... like, they're like, yes, but also me, uh, a kid named Jack, I'm also king. So it's like a very, yes, exactly. <laughs> very much like. <laughs> and then this other group of boys led by Jack is, is like, no, we live on this island now. We are people of the island. And their conception, I guess, of like what islanders do is like Jack immediately jumps to I'm the king and we're going to make and we're going to hunt for ourselves, which, you know, they got to eat something. Right. But they immediately jump from like, OK, well, let's like hunt some pigs. Let's like hunt these wild boars into essentially like sacrifice and power and war yeah and it makes me wonder especially since like at the end again spoiler alert they do eventually get uh rescued but it comes at the mm -hmm. very like the last few pages of the book right so it's like very yes. sudden and very like do sex machina about it 
Yeah, yeah. And I actually was listening to, um, there's a really great podcast that I love called Literary Disco, where they just talk about books. And I didn't realize this until they were talking about it. But Lord of the Flies actually seems to have been a response to a very, very popular kids book at the time that was about a group of it was essentially about the same thing, like a group of boys um, becoming stranded on an island. But it, but that book was like very, the perspective was like straight down the middle, n- no irony about it. These kids are like colonizers. And I believe mm. in that book, there are people on the island and they essentially show up and are like, you people are savages and teach them how to be like proper English gentlemen. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it was a very popular book at the time. That This and is, and oh my William God. And Golding some, was this like, is the fuck? <gasps> this would never happen this way. I love, I, I don't think there's anything I love more than nerd gossip. And this is like, yeah. giving my whole life. so this was a rejoinder to some like, like shitty yeah. ass, like no realism to it sort of perspective on on imperialism and colonizing oh my god yeah totally of william golding just being like nah man people are chaos people oh yeah are it's all about the illusion of civilization do. right and how quickly it'll break down it doesn't mm-hmm. even matter if it's children or not yeah so as far as sorting goes i this isn't this is another one where i'm like i'm really not sure because there is a real the like chaos of it to me almost seems like a Slytherin because oh see I see that as a Gryffindor but yes but I also feel like it is this to me speaks to like almost the twin sides of Gryffindor I the I view it as Jack like well okay Jack is like if we're we don't sort characters, but if we were to sort characters, but we're not sorting characters, right. uh, Jack is a Slytherin mm-hmm. in the fact that he's craving power. Right. But the like conflict that I think is driven through the whole thing is a Gryffindor struggle. I agree. Yeah. And and like the fact that Ralph has to be going to bat for Piggy like and, you know, taking care of everyone is, again, like a Gryffindorian sort of tale of this is fucked we have to fight for everybody but like it's all going to hell oh jesus christ and Mm -hmm. like it you agree that it's also designed maybe to by that nature to make you realize how all of these things can be like you can have these conflicting instincts within yourself and that these characters all kind of represent internal conflict within like of doing the right thing versus doing what feels good or is most convenient or that mm-hmm. will just get you farther ahead in life yeah in which case i would say it's a slytherin book only by that measure because not all as, slytherins as like a cautionary tale against giving into your worst impulses it's almost. like a self-aware slytherin who is saying i'm i'm here at these uh at a fork in the road mm-hmm. i realize i should be a ralph mm. but i could get so much more out of life if i'm a jack yeah, if mm. I'm if I'm a jack, then I can just do whatever the fuck I want. I like yeah. that as a turn. And the piggy is the part of you that's making you have the conversation to begin with. I mean, the piggy Ooh. is the Hufflepuff that's yes. trying Poor to. Piggy. Oh my Mediate. god, I loved Piggy so much as a kid reading it. So when I read it for the first time, and, and yeah, and again, uh, Piggy dies in this book. Piggy dies, and it's like it's the bad. first book I I am such I am I am so extra, and I have always been. This sometimes if I'm if I'm reading or watching something that's too intense, I have to literally put it down and walk away yeah. from it. I mourned for Piggy. Yeah. <laughs> I remember like I'm like I'm probably gonna fail the quiz tomorrow. I do not have time emotionally. <laughs> to go through this right now. <laughs> yeah, it's a rough read. It's hard. Uh, so what what is so I think we're we're all in in agreement that this is a slithering, yes? Yeah, I do think I do think it is. I think it tends more towards slithering because I would say too I I feel like in terms of the because I do think that the chaotic energy of this book feels very Gryffindor to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, I feel like the I feel like it is so so much of what this book is about is about self interest. Yes, um, and that's yeah, I, I think and, and, uh, I've said it before on the on the pod. I think that Gryffindors and Slytherins are basically the same, but it all comes down to who who you're serving yourself or the mm-hmm. community. And Gryffindors will ultimately sacrifice their self interest for the community, and Slytherins don't necessarily think that that's always the smartest move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so we have one more for sophomore year, yes? One more for sophomore year. And this one, um, I definitely read this book, but I I definitely read this book and I remember things about this book. But what I don't remember about this book is like the overarching themes. And that would be mm. The Outsiders. Oh, okay. okay. I um, have not read and know very little about the outsiders. So give me everything but the theme about the outsiders. So you've got two groups. The Soches are like the clean cut preppy kids. And then there's the like poor kids who are, I, if, from what I remember correctly, they're sort of like, they're troublemaker kids, right? Yeah. I don't really quite remember. And I think they're called the Greasers. They're absolutely called the Greasers. Okay. Like, you know, if you've seen Grease, this is going to be the more naturalistic version of that right. If I've only seen it on stage, is that okay? Ooh, I think no. it's fine. Okay. The score is not as good. The is horrific. <laughs> Wait, you haven't seen the movie version of Grease? No, I've not. Oh, wow. Weird. That's probably that's because that's you saw it on stage seen it and were like, all. this is trash. Um, <laughs> the stage show is terrible. It is ridiculous to me that anybody saw that stage show and was like, we should continue. We should let this exist. Oh, my um, goodness. Coming for but Grease. But the movie is amazing. <laughs> I, would, I would agree that, like, Grease is one of the few movie musicals that elevates the work. Yeah. And I say that as someone so who likes good. the stage play a lot and was uh, was in the musical. I played Jan of I'm, all characters. No! I'm, <laughs> I'm very ho-hum on the stage play. So The only so, thing I like more about the Grease, the stage musical, is jazz. Jan gets a song. Jan does get a song. <laughs> Jan and Marty both have their songs cut. And Marty's song is pretty cute in yeah. the stage play. But the stage play is just a mess. The movie actually gives you, like, themes and characters we'll sort um, Greece at another date but now we're doing the outsiders so what happens the in the outsiders and mm -hmm. i guess the just as far as like i feel like this one is one that probably i would need to flash short just because i don't remember very much about it but what i do remember about the outsiders is that it's about these two groups of people who don't understand each other the socials are very preppy and look down on uh pony boy and soda pop pony boy gotta stay gold um, kids die. This is another one where kids die. Yes. Um, I feel like sophomore year was really, I mean, across the board, like death was pretty prominent in all the books yeah. that you read. But like, I feel like sophomore year really stepped it up and was also like, oh, all the kids are dying. Yeah. They're like, like so you guys, it is 2004 and 50 years ago teenagers were dying and you kids are just sitting here reading um <laughs> that was my experience of sophomore year um i guess i would put outsiders as a hufflepuff because it's like can't we all just get along it's very much like the most straightforward class struggle narrative that you can get i yeah. see and then another thing to I think weight it is also remembering contextually some of the themes that were even allowed to be talked about at the time because mm -hmm. we're we're smack dab in the middle of like American propriety and this this is dealing more with things that the working class and people who are living in poverty are dealing with and that and you know taking a more realistic look at what teenagers are doing and wanting yeah, at and a time that that wasn't like this around the same like James Dean was 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 becoming an icon for mm -hmm. his teenage characters of having internal conflict and not necessarily being perfect <laughs> and the writer of this book Essie Hinton was a teenager when she wrote this I think she was like I wouldn't know that or 15 years old yeah she was a kid herself and was essentially just writing about like the class struggles that she saw in her community she, yeah, and like we're getting away from like the Andy Hardy sort of family narrative and being like something sometimes things are real fucked up at home mm -hmm. and that's why these things are now happening out on the street to these children. They're acting out because they have things that are underlying that yeah. they are projecting onto other teenagers essentially mm -hmm. as was the take I got from the film. I haven't read the book. I but if you want to see Tom Cruise's really teeth, watch time. the movie. <laughs> I haven't read it in a really long time, um, so let's put this in Hufflepuff because I guess why not? <laughs> I 
think that, so. That <laughs> let's put this in Hufflepuff because I guess why not is like that is the like the rationale. That is the ultimate Sorting Hat pod vibe. Is like. Yeah. I th- Whatever, dude. <laughs> the, sorting uh, hat, the sorting hat sits on the outsider's head and is like, this, uh, this seems like a kid with a good heart. Hufflepuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah why, why not? Uh, now, now we've been going for just about an hour, Woo! which is oh. approximately our our podcasty length. So I think we're entering two-parter I territory. Think, I don't want you to rush through mm. the other two years. This has been such a delight. Would you mind coming back uh, for, uh, for, the, for the following week that we have our pod? I would love to. Okay, cool. fantastic. Let's wrap so, it up here at sophomore year. Yeah, then. so that we're we're putting a pin in this, but don't worry, Gail and Crawley York will be back. We'll be dealing with junior and senior year in terms of uh, literary readings in the American school system. <laughs> uh, Galen, if we want to be finding more of you about the internet, where mm-hmm. might we look? My uh, Instagram and Twitter handle is Galen Crawley. You can find me there in both places. Uh, how, do you and, spell, uh, how do you spell that? Ah, uh, that is a great question. My name is weird to spell. G A L E N C R A W L E Y. Oh, I guessed it correctly on my first try. So Yay. the listeners might not have. Yeah, I'm smarter. and uh, if if you want to be seeing more from Reed or myself, you can follow us at that dang dingus and belated media respectively. You mm-hmm. can also follow us at sorting hat underscore pod and uh, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts because like, why not? Yeah. And like, since we're um, we'll be recording this later, if it happens to go up, like shoot us the idea, uh, some ideas for books that you might want us to cover either in this episode or the next episode or in the future. Cause I always want to know what y'all are thinking about when you, when you're listening to this. Yeah, Let us know if, if you read any of the books that Galen uh, had to read that were a little more on the, on the outsider side of things. <laughs> no pun intended wordplay. Intended. All right. I'm going to put a bookmark in you right there. <laughs> All right. Bye everybody. Bye.